I'm Wallace Arthur. I'm an evolutionary biologist, and I'm professor, uh, emeritus professor of zoology at the National University of Ireland in Galway. Um, as a zoologist, uh, in terms of organisms, the group that I'm most interested in the evolution of, of course, is animals. And in terms of approach to evolution, I specialize in the relatively new approach that goes by the strange nickname of Evo Devo. So the question really becomes, what is this thing we call Evo Devo? Its full name is Evolutionary Developmental Biology. And essentially, it's an approach to evolution in which uh, studying evolutionary changes in the process of embryonic development uh, is uh, central. It's the central focus of, of this approach. Uh, and this focus makes sense because when you think about it, there is um, no way that evolution can directly change one kind of adult animal into another kind of adult animal, it has to uh, effect this transition uh, through uh, a process of gradually deflecting the course of embryonic development over a period of uh, many generations. And uh, an example of this would be uh, turning a dinosaur into a bird, an evolutionary transition that we know happened, but you can't do it directly. You have to do it gradually by uh, modifying the course of embryonic development so that in the end, the developmental process ends up producing not uh, a dinosaur as it did in the past, but a bird as it now does in the present. I got involved in Evo Devo when I uh, began to focus on the question of how uh, new kinds of animals uh, arose. Um, and I began to question uh, whether the classic kind of evolutionary case study, like uh, that on Darwin's finches, uh, could it actually explain major origins. So, for example, when you're looking at a small group of species uh, where the main differences are uh, relatively slight ones in the size and shape of the beaks, uh, the embryonic development of these species is essentially the same. However, if you take one species of bird and one species of mammal, for example, and compare these all the way through their, their life cycle from egg to adult, what you find is that the embryonic development is very different, even from uh, very near the beginning. And so I became fascinated by how uh, embryonic development changes in the course of evolution. Uh, the book is called Understanding Evo Devo, and it's aimed at a very general audience. And in any field of science, uh, if you're going to write a book, uh, you can basically write it for two kinds of audience, either um, people who are already inside the field, in which case you can write a high-level book with lots of technical jargon. Uh, people will go with you because they know the jargon and so on. Or you can write an introductory book for people who are outside of the field and would like a glimpse inside it, would like to find out what this uh, field of science, in this case a, a relatively new field of science, is about. So this is decidedly one of the latter uh, uh, kind of book. It's uh, an introductory text. It's meant for people who uh, are not uh, Evo Devo specialists. And uh, I imagine the readership will be very varied. Uh, but probably one quite big category will be uh, students right across the biological sciences, uh, but not specifically uh, within Evo Devo, who want to know something about this new approach to evolution and how it differs from approaches that went before it. One uh, evolutionary origin that I find particularly fascinating is that of uh, the group that we call the turtles. 
in a broad sense. This includes all the uh, marine and fresh water and uh, terrestrial forms, even though sometimes we, we talk about the terrestrial forms as tortoises. But if we call the whole group turtles in the broad sense, there are a few hundred species, and they're all characterized by the possession of this incredible shell. Now, if we look across the vertebrates, um, including mammals like ourselves, other reptiles, birds, fish, etc., um, this is the only group which has a uh, hard integral shell. So um, the ancestors of turtles, which were reptiles, um, did not have a shell any more than other groups of reptiles today, like uh, snakes and, and lizards have a shell. So somehow in the origin of the turtle body form, from some um, antecedent reptile, um, the, the, the shell appeared from nowhere. And, and, and it's really, uh, therefore, a fascinating question uh, how uh, that transition took place. And in Evo Devo, to try to understand uh, such an origin, we bring together lots of different kinds of evidence, lots of different kinds of information. And so, for example, uh, in this case, it's helpful to uh, juxtapose both fossil information and uh, information on embryonic development. Now, classic evolutionary studies would have always brought into play fossil information, but not so much developmental information. It's the combination of the two uh, that really, for me, works uh, to take us forward in understanding what's happening. And so uh, looking at the fossil side first, we see that uh, many millions of years ago, uh, the very first turtles um, had only half a shell. Uh, I mean, this was a, a very strange finding, but it's, it's true. Um, so you go back in the fossil record and you find a kind of turtle, semi-turtle, if you like to call it that, that had the, the ventral, the, the lower side of the shell, uh, but not the dorsal side, the big domed bit that we call the carapace. So we went in stages from no shell through a ventral shell to a complete integral shell uh, with both parts connecting uh, with each other in the way that we know uh, from uh, the turtles of today. Now, uh, with regard to the developmental side of things, um, it's interesting because evolving a shell means all sorts of other things have to change. And one of the uh, interesting changes that's happened in the turtle lineage is that the shoulder girdle has moved inside the rib cage. Now, it has to move inside the rib cage because uh, the ribs themselves are fused into the shell. So when you think about it, if you check your own shoulder braid or scapula, which is just uh, some, a big flat bone that you can reach over your own shoulder, you can feel it there because it's outside the rib cage. And in most vertebrates, that's where it is. So that's true in, in, in uh, mammals. It's true in uh, reptiles other than turtles. So, for example, lizards. Um, but uh, in the stem lineage leading to turtles, somehow that shoulder girdle had to be moved inside uh, the, uh, the rib cage, as opposed to being outside. And as part of that, uh, the ribs are because they're fused into the shell. They're migrating more in a in a, in, in a lateral direction than downwards ventrally, as they do in a typical vertebrate. And um, in terms of what happens in turtle embryos, we now know that the ribs are deflected outwards as opposed to downwards because they're attracted by uh, chemicals secreted by a little embryonic structure called the carapacial ridge which doesn't exist in other vertebrates, uh, but does in the turtles. So here you see the way in which uh, embryological development gets altered in the course of evolution. Now, of course, uh, this isn't yet a complete answer, but it's a very big step in the right direction and one that uh, Evo Devo will build on in the upcoming years uh, until eventually we have uh, what we think is a complete understanding of the evolution of this fascinating turtle body form. I think for the reader who's from outside of 
Evil Devo, which of course is where I expect almost all of my readers to be from, uh, the most amazing thing uh, that they'll discover is that the same genes are used uh, to build uh, similar structures in different animals, despite the fact that the structures have completely different engineering bases, and despite the fact that the animals concerned are very only very distantly related. So, for example, if you take eyes, um, uh, there are certain genes that are involved in making the human eye. Now, it isn't very surprising to us that the same genes would be involved in making the eyes of a monkey, or even a mouse, or even uh, a lizard, let's say, because uh, we're all vertebrates, uh, the eyes are, are, are of a broadly similar um, structure, and uh, therefore, uh, to some extent, um, finding that, that the same gene makes the eyes in these different vertebrates went along with expectation. But what didn't go along with expectation, um, and by that I mean the, the pre-Evo Devo expectations of early evolutionary and developmental biologists, what didn't go along with expectations was the fact that even in an insect with a radically different kind of eye, the compound eye that we can see in houseflies or bees or, or whatever, um, even in this case, again, it's the same genes that are involved in making the eye. And this isn't just a one-off story because it applies to other structures as well. So you can actually tell the same story in relation to legs rather than eyes. So again, uh, from a starting point of humans, we would kind of expect that other vertebrates, monkeys, mice, lizards, whatever, um, we would expect uh, that because the, the, the limbs have a similar kind of structure, a similar kind of engineering basis, uh, that perhaps the same genes would be involved in their development, which indeed they are. But again, when we move across to the insects or other arthropods, uh, where we have a completely different kind of leg based on an exoskeleton rather than an endoskeleton with bones, uh, again we find that uh, in beginning the development of the limb, uh, we have the same genes involved. And uh, it turns out that a relatively small group of genes, which we now call the toolkit genes, are responsible for a lot of the developmental process right across the animal kingdom. And uh, a major strand of Evo Devo, perhaps even we might say the major strand of Evo Devo, involves studying uh, this fascinating group of genes which uh, regulate the process of development very widely across the animal kingdom and which are the genes that evolution works on in order to bring about evolutionary changes in developmental pathways.